So, I'm Richard Brain, UKIP leader. Uh, live Q&A tonight, looking forward to it. I've got quite a few questions come in, so I'll get started on those. I may skip a few, especially if I don't know the answers. Uh, so, please be patient with me. And I'm afraid I'm not, I'm not going to be able to follow the, uh, the uh, live comments at the same time, because I've got too much on my plate. And I apologize for my glasses. I'm an old man. So, let's look. The parliamentarian wave. If you were elected prime minister in a snap election, however unlikely, yes, what would your first act as prime minister be? I think uh, probably have a nice pint of cold pale ale and possibly even a sneaky cigarette. Um, but I want to get together with all of the great people that have got me there because it's fantastic working with teams. It's the best thing in politics, meeting the members, working with members. I love the crew. I love the kippers. And um, I remember very well after the referendum vote, we got in the van and we drove to uh, Downing Street so that we could be in annoyance at seven in the morning by beeping the horn and singing and shouting out the window and celebrating the fantastic victory. So, um, if I was elected prime minister, I'd be going to Downing Street to celebrate a fantastic victory, uh, but not in a van. Uh, so there you go. But it would certainly be to celebrate with my uh, with my crew uh, before getting down to the uh, serious business of hard work. So uh, that's it. Uh, what's your stance? This is the real slam. Thank you very much. What's your stance on nuclear energy? Would you support increasing output and building more plants? Um, yes, uh, I would. I mean, th the reality is that nuclear energy is one of the cleanest, very, very cleanest forms of energy, possibly the cleanest. Uh, what we do is we gather up uh, dangerous radioactive material that is just in the earth, uh, in, in radioactive ore, uranium, plutonium, or ore, all the other ores that you have uh, with, with uh, radioactive material in them, and we refine them. And so... By, I mean, in real terms, what we're doing is we're gathering up a poison that is very broadly spread in the soil, in the ground of the earth, and we're concentrating it all in one place, getting a whole load of energy out of it. And then once we've done that, we take the remnants, which is a very, very small, I mean, physically, it's a very, very small uh, amount of material, and uh, we bury it, you know, a kilometer deep, uh, somewhere really safe. So... Um, so I, I, I'm not, I don't worry too much about nuclear power. Very few people have actually been killed in the nuclear power generation industry compared to, let's say, wind um, and you know all kinds of other construction of coal power stations. So it's, it's a particularly clean and safe form of power. Uh, the only downside, of course, is, this, uh, is the issue of nuclear non-proliferation and um, the agreements that we have uh, not to just build more and more and more nuclear weapons because when you there is a connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons when you refine uh, nuclear materials um, it's certainly more cost effective if you have both a nuclear power program and a nuclear weapons program uh, the two grades of, um, of nuclear material are are not entirely the same and uh, so that generally has been the case that countries that had a nuclear weapons program also had a nuclear power program but it doesn't have to be like that. And I think that that could be pleased to monitor properly. And uh, I think that we should look, we'll look again at nuclear power. I think engineering has advanced so much in the last 20, 30, 40 years. And um, so I'm certain that we can run, particularly in terms of information technology. So I think that we're very likely able to run nuclear power stations, design them better, build them better, run them more safely. Uh, and yes, I support more nuclear power. And I think Britain is a great engineering country, uh, the country that sparked really the Industrial Revolution, or certainly one, one of the most important ones, um, should, uh, should actually develop this expertise further. We did very well after the war uh, to build our own weapons program and, um, and power program, uh, and we should get back into it. Next question. Uh, I want to hear more about UKIP's housing policy and what ideas they have to help hard-working private renting families, uh, more than 50% of our earnings go on rent and utilities. Well, okay, there's various things here. Of course, the number one thing here is immigration. Um, 
immigration puts enormous pressure on our housing stock and on British people's access to uh, rented flats uh, and housing generally, social housing, everything. Uh, it makes property prices very high. Um, <clears throat> some people think that's a good thing because they're investing in the property market and good for them, they're, they're running a business. Equally, there's a lot of youngsters in their 20s for whom it's pretty much impossible to get onto the housing ladder. Uh, and so you can argue there is an upside to the, um, the UK property prices, at least staying where they, where they are, if not going down, uh, but not going up further, because that is a, a serious crisis. We've got probably at least 150,000 people coming into London every year. Um, and that, again, is just putting increasing pressure on housing. Um, there's a lot of buildings in London that have been bought as investment that are not actually inhabited, uh, residential buildings. Uh, and they've been invested in by people from all across the world because the London property market, and the UK property market generally, uh, has been so successful. Um, and we certainly would like to look at ways of encouraging people to use the housing stock that we have, a lot of it which just goes unused. And we have a policy on that, which is to stop uh, foreign investment in UK property, uh, particularly where there's a record of, of it sitting empty. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, an important thing. But the main thing is taking charge of immigration and reducing, uh, or well, controlling and, and reducing the vast growth in pressure on our existing housing market. If, unless you do that, there's no amount of house building that can help because uh, you'll just have to go on building houses forever until, uh, like the J.G. Ballard story, you know, whole whole uh, districts start collapsing in on themselves uh, with the uh, hundreds or thousands of stories of of building that you've uh, that you've built. Um, that's a, a, a dystopian science fiction story, but actually, um, parts of this country are moving towards very densely populated areas without a lot of public facilities. Where I live is a, is a case in point in, in Chelsea, you know, very large numbers of uh, colleges, churches, sports grounds, every kind of public facility uh, have been turned into flats. Man, there are churches near me that have been turned into flats. Uh, and I think that's, that's tragic. And um, also, you know, for instance, up the road, King's College used to have a large hall of residence. That's now all very, very expensive managed executive flats. Um, presumably with uh, lots of basement parking and so on. And and what else has been built? Have all the facilities been built? There's the the you know this the infrastructure, the social structure. Has that all been built? No. It's just more and more and more flats. Let's keep building flats. We can stack them high, sell them cheap. Uh, and in the end, of course, that uh, poor approach to planning produces ghettos. And what people thought was, uh, a, a, you know, a, a lovely, nice neighborhood gradually becomes uh, less, less liked and, uh, you know, can suffer as a result. So immigration is the, is the first thing, stop the patient bleeding. Let's get back to the next question we've got. Uh, immigration policy. We have a very good immigration policy. This is from Matt FM 101. Thank you, Matt. Um, immigration policy is... A uh, key UKIP selling point. We have been promoting for many, many years a points-based system that looks very carefully at immigration and tries to make sure that the people who do come to this country uh, are real contributors to this country. Uh, we have too many people coming to this country. We have uh, too many unskilled people coming to this country. Um, of course, they're rational, decent people. Uh, uh, and they're coming here because there are a lot of privileges uh, living in the UK, free healthcare and schools and housing and everything. So, of course, lots of people come. They're only rational. But uh, you can't have open borders and a generous welfare state. The two things don't go together. Um, so our policy is to get much stricter on immigration while trying to maintain uh, the support that people have. Uh, to some extent, from the state. In the long run, we're a libertarian party. We want to reduce state dependency. Independence is in the party's name, and dependency is something that we are philosophically against. Uh, and so, unlike really most of the other parties, certainly Liberal Democrats, Labour, and to some extent now the Tories, uh, we don't believe in a burgeoning state. We want to reduce it. 
We want to reduce regulation, we want to reduce tax, and we want to reduce state dependency. Uh, let's come down to the next question. RS Gamer 2419. Will you continue to promote UKIP as a common sense middle ground party, but also as the UK's only blue Labour party, since we want to nationalise utilities and the middle ground gig is pretty lib dem? Uh, it's quite a complicated question. I shall endeavour to answer that as best I can. Um, I think UKIP actually is a middle ground party. We're obviously labelled as extreme right wing fascists, you know, and all this sort of stuff. But really, the only reason we get labelled that is because everyone else has moved so far to the left over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, even the Tories have moved a long way to the left. Are we live? Hello? Are we live? Let me just check it. Are we live? Okay. That's it. Can you hear me? Still there? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm live again, so great, thank you. Um, bear with me a second. So, where do we get to? Yes, a very complicated question about the middle ground. Um, I filled out the political compass test uh, not long ago, and um, and uh, the when I answered all the questions, 50, 100 questions, something like that, uh, I found that I was bang in the middle of the of the graph, you know, halfway between left and right halfway between uh, authoritarian and libertarian. Uh, so I'm certainly a centrist. I'm middle of the road according to political compass. Um, I don't believe in, you know, ideologically privatizing everything. I think there are some networks, national networks, where you can't really get competition, uh, which is the key advantage of free markets. And um, if you can't really get competition, you can't get that advantage for the consumers. So to my mind, it's an open question. Some networks like railway networks, perhaps, or uh, telecoms networks, or let's say the water mains, uh, may be examples of networks where it makes more sense to have one uh, network that is inevitably a monopoly uh, and that is non-profit and state run, uh, because otherwise, you know, digging up the streets to have two separate water networks, I think everybody can understand that that is wasteful uh, and probably doesn't work from a competition point of view. So um, that's why I would say I'm middle of the road. That, that said, we are a libertarian party and we do think that the market generally is, is the best answer. Uh, it's better that things are handled by individuals, companies exchanging goods, exchanging money with each other uh, to get things done than um, the state being in charge of everything. There are so many examples from the 20th century of a big over, overgrown state uh, trying to do everything centrally or, or trying to take charge of everything, and it is invariably a disaster. Uh, the Soviet Union, uh, Mao's China, uh, you know, Ca uh, Cambodia under Pol Pot, Cuba, disastrous. Uh, over and over again, you see this idea of state control, state, state uh, ownership of property or property and so on, and it's, it is disastrous. So uh, that's that. Uh, let's see, the common sense middle ground. So I think that is middle ground in terms of right-left. As Marine Le Pen said, there's no right-left anymore. There are any patriots and globalists. Uh, UKIP is certainly a patriotic party, not a globalist party. Um, so that's it. Middle ground, certainly. Uh, Force 997. Uh, what would you think about developing a new brand for UKIP for post-Brexit Britain without the public opinion baggage, which will ensure the new Tories stay right-wing and if not deposed? Well, the thing is, I actually love the UKIP brand. I think the pound sign is a demonstration of the wisdom of not joining the euro. 
uh, and it, it demonstrates a lot of what the UK is about. Having our own independent currency is crucial. Um, the colors are distinctive. Uh, no one else has those colors. Most of the other colors are taken. But also the name of the party, UK Independence Party. The independence is central to our whole political outlook. And uh, we need to stick with that. Independence is what it's about. We haven't won it yet. But we need to make sure that we actually get our independence. And my view is we're going to have to keep fighting for our independence, even if Brexit ever happens. Uh, because there's no question I've spoken to many, um, you know, fanatical uh, brainwashed Remainers uh, who are getting ready for the, the great push towards rejoining the EU. They can't wait to belong to a totalitarian empire uh, that tells them uh, everything that they have to think. And uh, so those people are certainly going to keep fighting to rejoin the EU and we're going to have to keep fighting for our independence. Uh, so independence is in our name. I don't think UKIP needs a rebrand. 27 years fighting for our independence. We've done fantastically well. We've been the most successful uh, party really in the last 30 years in that we've forced the other parties to uh, take very seriously our in incredibly you know, revolutionary uh, policy of Brexit, of leaving the EU. So I think that we should be very proud of the party and our brand is fantastic and all we need to do is get out there and make sure that everyone can see how great UKIP is. Uh, how, what a load of nonsense the press talks when they're rude about us and call us racist this and you know little Englanders and all of that you know, extremist all of that stuff all of it, all complete nonsense so let's be proud of you get proud of our brand uh, and make sure uh, that people see it I've just ordered a hundred flags you get flags today which uh, hopefully we'll be seeing soon so let's be proud of you get brand and let's keep it that's my view uh, how do you plan this is from ox how do you plan to bring UKIP back to popularity after the crash during the last two months? Um, the main crash actually for UKIP was that after the referendum uh, and this extraordinary success that the party had, uh, large numbers of people went back to voting Tory and Labour. And if you look at the 2017 general election, Tories and Labour had record high votes, huge turnout, huge vote for both of them. Both of them grew their vote share. Of course, they were promising in their manifestos that we would actually leave the European Union. I mean, it was a massive lie. They've spent every ounce of energy and uh, guile that they have, uh, and frankly, um, uh, uh, sh shameless sh shamelessness that they have, uh, refusing to do what they put in their own manifestos. And so um, I, I would say... Uh, that that's the real source of UKIP's uh, drop in popularity. Uh, many UKIP supporters went off to their previous parties, uh, thinking wrongly, of course, that those parties would support uh, actually leaving the EU. Um, so one thing that would make UKIP more popular again, I do believe, is if this uh, treacherous Tory government, which has spent three years not delivering Brexit, continues to fail to deliver Brexit. And I think if they don't give us a proper Brexit, which they call no deal, it means it doesn't mean no deal, it means hundreds of deals, uh, great deals. Uh, but um, if they fail to deliver that, I think it's really over for the Tories. Uh, and I think they will have probably handed this country over to uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who's nuts. And I don't think he will last very long in power because I think his government will be uh, catastrophic. Uh, and um, I really hope that doesn't happen. So... Boris, deliver Brexit, real Brexit, by letting us leave. That's the issue. Let's deal with the issue of being more popular in the future. Our policies have been arrived at over decades. We don't. We think deeply about things. We think seriously about the problems that the UK has. And we have the courage to talk about the things that most politicians are too scared to talk about because they're too worried about being politically incorrect uh, and all of that sort of stuff. And UKIP is a party that has uh, um, the guts, actually, the guts to talk about important things. Um, immigration. You know, of course, you're immediately labelled a racist as soon as you talk about immigration. The fact is that it's a very large number of, of immigrants in the UK who suffer most from our excessive levels of immigration. UKIP can talk about that. They'll call us racist. Let them. We're not racists. Frankly, I think they're racist because these are people ultimately who don't believe in British people, who, who uh, think that the British people should uh, just simply 
go away in silence and disappear. Uh, so they're racist. We've got great immigration policy. We've got great policy on free speech. We've got a great political culture in our party uh, to tell the truth, even when it's dangerous to do so, even when people will, uh, you'll be unpopular for doing so. But the truth must out, and we have the guts to deliver it. So that's why UKIP will continue and will grow in the future as more and more people see what a great benefit we brought to this country by uh, securing the Brexit referendum and then securing the win in the referendum and hopefully sometime soon actually leaving, being free again, and going on to great prosperity as an independent nation. Let's see now. We've got, uh, how do you plan to bring, uh, what have we got? That's, uh, I've got a picture, uh, question here from Joel. Joel, good to hear from you. Uh, should the basic rate of income tax and personal national insurance contributions be merged into one tax at around 30% for income above 40,000 and up to? Too complicated, have to deal with it on another day. We may well have uh, interesting tax ideas in our next update to our manifesto. Don't forget the UKIP manifesto evolves. Um, and uh, we've certainly got ideas about that. And one thing that I think is quite likely is that we will argue for raising the basic threshold for tax, uh, income tax, to £20,000 or higher, um, because, uh, because that makes sense. Uh, because taking people out of paying tax is good news. It makes life simpler. It puts more money in their pockets. And we think that you can do that and still actually service our state effectively uh, with the existing tax, other, other tax. Um, we also, of course, want to abolish inheritance tax. We want to abolish the TV license, a terrible tax. Uh, disgraceful people are being forced to pay for propaganda that they despise and don't believe in, uh, and which makes them angry. Um, we also want to uh, consider attacking uh, VAT. VAT is a tax that was uh, in, that we, we're forced to have because of membership of the EU. Uh, and in fact, it's complicated. Everyone hates it. Uh, and it may be replaceable by a very simple sales tax. It may not. But certainly we're open to, uh, to the abolition of, in, of uh, VAT uh, value-added tax. So uh, we'll talk about that more when we have a new manifesto. Another one from Jolly. It should be That's the same one. Uh, digital meat. Digital meat. Uh, it says, quick question, does this dress make my ass look big? Yes, yeah, you shouldn't wear that one. Uh, I'd find something a bit roomier. Uh, you look like you've been poured in, but you're gonna spill out. Uh, Janice, hi Janice, what should we do if Brexit doesn't happen or it's a botched job on the 31st of October? We should keep fighting. We've been fighting for 27 years and we're gonna go on fighting and we're not gonna give up. And I think that even if they do try to botch it and stop us leaving, we will quickly be able to uh, reach um, a new level of power in our parliament. I think that we can get really pro-Brexit MPs into parliament if that happens, uh, and lots of them. They may not all be UKIP. Some of them may be Brexit Party. Some of them may be Tories who are fervently pro-Brexit. Uh, and there may be pro-Brexit people in other parties. But I think that a pro-Brexit parliament is coming, maybe especially if Johnson fails to deliver Brexit properly. So, uh, so, so don't give up hope. We'll keep fighting uh, and we're going to get people into parliament and we're going to make sure that one day this country is independent because we're the UK Independence Party. Uh, what have we got? Pamela Hood. Hi, Pamela. Uh, how are you going to sort out the internal debacle that is causing so much stress amongst the members who are left hanging by a thread? This is a very good question. Uh, I don't like washing uh, UK dirty laundry in public, uh, and I'm loath to be too critical of uh, people who have um, significant power over me and my activities as party leader. Uh, I will say, make sure you vote for the right NEC members. Uh, look carefully at it. Don't uh, necessarily vote for integrity people. Vote for people who are moderate like me, who recognize that there's no need for Tommy to join the party, who have the guts to stand by what we believe, 
uh, and two, also don't want to head into a kind of politically correct area that, that Nigel has taken the Brexit party into, where they've got people like Brexit Henrik, who um, tweets in favour of uh, giving money to NGOs that ferry people across the Mediterranean. Um, they've got communists in the party. Uh, they've, they've picked all, a lot of their candidates based on, you know, intersectional, you know, we need one lesbian, and we need an Indian person, we need uh, one white person, and we need, you know, all of that nonsense. Identity politics, uh, picking candidates by identity, is a very bad idea. Uh, people should be picked, candidates should be picked on the strength of their character and what's in their hearts and what they believe and what they can do for their constituencies if they're elected, for their constituents if they're elected. Uh, so they should be elected on their character and their commitment and their ability to think freely and represent people. Uh, that's what UKIP's about, and um, that's that. Right, uh, thank you, Pamela. The day back, we'll, we shall move on from that, I hope. And the NEC election, hopefully, will be uh, the means by which we do that. Rory Crawford. Hello, Richard. What advice would you give someone hoping to stand as an MSP in the future as a UKIP candidate? Well, more or less what I've just said, go out and talk openly to people, make the arguments. Remember that the UK union, the union between Scotland and England and Wales, has been probably the most successful uh, na national union of nations in history. Uh, and we shouldn't underestimate that. So uh, make sure you make that argument that we are in favour of unions that work, like the one between England and Scotland, and not in favour of unions that don't work, like the tyrannical union that has been established, centred in Brussels, that isn't democratic, that is designed not to be democratic, and which fails to represent the very peoples that are um, its populace. So that's the main thing. And also, don't give up. Keep trying. Uh, Scotland is certainly going to be a tough nut to crack for UKIP. I was talking to a very nice Scots lady today, and she is fervent in her belief in the party. Don't forget that 30, well, how many, 50, uh, it was 55%, I think, um, uh, voted for the union, voted uh, no to Scottish independence. And uh, there's a lot of people in Scotland who identify as British and who recognise that the English and the Welsh and the Northern Irish are their cousins and they want to stay in the union, which has been so successful. Um, and of course, don't forget that when it came to the referendum, 38% of Scots voted to leave the European Union, which uh, they obviously don't see as in any way a substitute for the great union of the nations in these islands. Uh, so keep campaigning for that. The union and the fraternity of the nations of the United Kingdom. Uh, what have we got? Rory Crawford. Hello, Richard. Uh, no, I've read that one. Speak a little. Okay, I'll, I've been asked to speak a little louder. I'll try to I might bring the microphone a bit closer. Uh, what have we got next? Lady Parallel. Do you stand with the people of Hong Kong? Yes, definitely. Uh, I do. I think that the Chinese government is a pretty totalitarian government. I think that uh, Hong Kong to a great extent, became culturally British in the 100 years that uh, it was such an enormous commercial success. And uh, we should be proud of Hong Kong and our relationship with it uh, and the extraordinary success that it became uh, under British rule. Um, and we should certainly stand with uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, people because uh, they are our cultural cousins and they are campaigning uh, for their independence in a way as well, just as we are. Um, and they're campaigning also for a lot of the values that we share. So I stand with them, absolutely. Uh, Sebastian Walsh, what's your opinion on freedom of speech in universities as the pre as the preset left-wing dogma is present? How do you change this? Um, this is a this is a it's very very sad question. Yesterday I walked through uh, Westminster and I met uh, a girl who worked who was uh, doing a PhD, I think, at the Scottish University. And um, she was one of the most programmed, bigoted, aggressive, arrogant, unthinking, brainwashed, rude people that I've ever met. Um, uh, if she's watching, I don't care. She probably wouldn't be. She's too busy 
um, campaigning for things that don't about things that don't exist. Um, and she was 29. She's doing a PhD, but she is. I thought she was. I thought a very typical and very bad example of. And, and let me get this straight. There are lots of people at university who who reject this very dogmatic orthodoxy and who quietly get on with questioning the world, uh, and questioning what they're taught uh, and thinking deeply about things. Um, but they have a difficult time, a lot of them, because there is a very serious public pressure in universities uh, to just conform. Uh, I've got a friend who um, went for a walk with his very elderly uh, and rather conservative, very conservative, in, uh, in perhaps in a negative sense, uh, grandmother, lovely lady, a long time ago. And she said to him, I'll give you one piece of advice. Always conform. And um, that obviously is the one of the stupidest uh, pieces of advice anybody can ever give. Uh, it's very, very important not to conform. We need a new punk in universities. In the 1970s, the punk movement uh, enabled people to say the unsayable uh, and to shock and horrify uh, everyone. And uh, it was, they didn't wait, you know, to be asked, to be allowed. They just thrust themselves forwards, the punks, and said, no, this is how we're going to be. Uh, loathe us, fear us, we don't care, because this is what we are, and we have the courage and the energy uh, to, to not be ashamed of ourselves, and we're going to stand up, and we're going to make music, and we're going to wear bizarre clothes, and we're going to challenge orthodoxy. What's sad today is you look at the people who think they're punks at the Extinction Rebellion march, uh, and they're nothing of the sort. They're slavish, um, mind-numbed um, servants of a, of a bizarre uh, sort of Marxist industry around frightening people into handing over more and more tax money so that we can uh, you know, have more and more people uh, paid by the state not to do very much, um, except talk hot air. So, so, yes, what's needed on the campuses is a new kind of punk, a new courage to go out there and seriously offend and disappoint uh, and, and be quite aggressive towards the orthodoxy and to make sure that it understands that there are those of us out here who loathe what uh, youngsters are being told in universities, this, all of this soft Marxist nonsense, and how, um, well, we, I won't go into it, you all know what I'm talking about, the whole intersectional um, you know, uh, attack on Western civilization, uh, standards, ideas, uh, all of that. So uh, stand up against it. You may be thrown out of university. If you do get thrown out of university, for offending people um, by refusing to bow down to the orthodoxy, go and get a job uh, and work hard, and you'll get a good. Uh, if you work hard after getting a job, uh, you'll do well, and you'll start to make some money, and then uh, you'll get much further than all the people who stayed at university, having their minds filled with manure. Right, where have we got to? Uh, what is going to happen with the UKIP North conference? What are the details? In mid-November, there's a conference in York. It's very exciting. It's a one-day conference, very nice hotel, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I shall be there speaking, and there'll be many other speakers, and I'm really looking forward to it. We had a fantastic conference in Eastbourne this summer uh, where we had a leadership hustings, and I really enjoyed that conference, and it was a, a, a great success. And I'm hoping that the Yorkshire conference will be uh, just as successful and exciting, uh, and I think it's highly likely it will be. So please buy a ticket. Please come, please enjoy it, hang out with like-minded people, uh, always the most interesting uh, and exciting people in the country gather at UKIP events, uh, always great people to talk to, so come along to that conference please, it's going to be great and I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, where would you like UKIP to be in one year's time under your leadership? Well, back up in the polls, that's the thing. We need to influence the political agenda in this country and to do that we've got to get votes we need to get people elected to councils. We need to get try to get people into our parliament. We've got to keep fighting for that. And 
it can take a while to do that. We know that Nigel Farage, for instance, tried to get elected to Parliament, Parliament seven times and failed on every occasion. Um, and uh, there's some, uh, there's some uh, uh, bit of a stink about the last time because uh, there certainly were some irregularities in uh, Tory spending in that case. And some extraordinary things went on, as far as I can tell, during the count as well. But um, it's hard to get into our parliament. That's the whole point about first past the post. But as uh, John F. Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon uh, not because it's easy, but because it is difficult. And we have to take the same attitude, I think, to first past the post, which is um, we, we're going to have to fight, keep fighting and we're going to have to get better at it. Uh, and we've got a mountain to climb to get there. Uh, but uh, with uh, determination and right on our side and the right policies, uh, I think that we have a chance of coming back, especially because of what's happened in the last few years, as I think more and more people have realised that the um, UK political establishment uh, turned out not to be what it's claimed to be. Uh, next question we've got, uh, do you think UKIP, this is from Mark199, um, do you think UKIP can attract former Labour working class voters? I bet that's a centre Labour voter who feels the party has completely betrayed the working class. Labour equals identity politics. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, and I think we can attract Labour voters. And I think that there are lots of Labour voters who voted Leave and who are patriotic uh, and also who understand that, you know, Labour is, is, they should be about actually working, doing a proper job of work, uh, whatever it may be, uh, whether you drive a van or a forklift or whether you work in a scientific laboratory or um, anywhere, a think tank, doesn't matter. But the, the, the fact is that uh, work is work and all of us have to do it uh, to survive. Uh, you know, is that, the, is that the definition of working class, that you have to work for a living? Well, maybe. I remember um, someone saying to me that the definition of a gentleman was someone who didn't have to get up in the morning if he didn't feel like it. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that definition. But can we appeal to left, uh, to left wing and Labour voters? Yes, I think so. To be fair, um, the, the whole issue of left-right, as Marina Penn said, is... is maybe a bit obsolete now. The 20th century, I think, demonstrated pretty conclusively that the Marxian ideology uh, would pretty much always lead to horrors, starvation, murder, slaughter, uh, misgovernment, uh, unfairness on a scale you haven't seen. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, I think, I suppose what that boils down to is that uh, I don't think working class people need to be left wing. I think they can be moderate now. I think there are lots of working class people who are moderate, who recognize that that experiment in the 20th century was a failure. Um, and that old fashioned Marxist ideology isn't going to help them. Uh, come to UKIP. We're pragmatists. We're common sense. Uh, we are quite middle of the road generally in politics. Um, and the main thing is that we want Britain to thrive because we want individuals and their families to, to thrive, to have opportunity, to have jobs, to have freedom, to uh, not be worried about excessive levels of regulation and law that make it difficult to start up businesses or, or that make it difficult to, to do a, any number of things. Uh, so we believe in freedom uh, and the duties of individuals uh, to work build a better society. So come to us. No reason why not to, uh, especially if you're a patriot and you love your country. Uh, Roger Arthur. Hello, Roger. Good to hear a question from you. Good to see you, Richard. The party has experienced many travails in recent times. As you know, successful organizations do not roll on from one problem to the next without learning. So do you not think that it is time to hold an independent review on recent events? Interesting idea. Party membership has been in a new downward trend since July. Uh, confidence in the party. Well, okay, there's a lot of stuff in there, Roger. I do agree with you that we need to look carefully at it. One of the things that, as you know, I've been pushing for is a, is a, a, a forum where we start to actually see members voting. Um, 
that's because it's important to know what the members of this party think. Uh, I would argue that the NEC and some members of it are not necessarily in touch with uh, what a lot of the members think. I've been to as many branches as I can in the last few weeks since I was elected leader. And the my general impression is that most UK members are quite moderate. They do not fall into one fringe or the other of this conflict that has been raging for the last uh, a few months, six months, um, and they just want to get on with the business of the party, and I certainly feel like that. So how do we find out what members think? I think a forum where people can vote on all sorts of matters is a good idea uh, so that we can get a better idea of um, what members think. Also, the engagement of people in that forum. We need to get people more engaged in the business of the party, and I think it will achieve that. Uh, as opposed uh, an independent review, difficult to organize. Who's going to be independent? Who are you going to choose on your panel? Um, that's one of the issues. Okay, that's uh, so that would be my solution to it, is rather than an independent review by a small number of people, I would like to see a Back on. Am I, am I visible? Can you see me? Can someone type in just to say that you can see me, please? Sound quality is poor. Sorry about that. Uh, can you see me? Just want to check that I'm still on. Can you see me? So if someone could write in, yes. Uh, not enough video, let's try it again. There we go. Can you see me? Someone could uh, just type in, let me know that you can see me, that would be great. Am I up? Who can see me? Okay, so I'm assuming that I can be seen. Okay, great. Thank you. Confirmation there uh, that I can be seen. Thank you very much. So uh, let's come back to that question, the last one, which was about, uh, yes, a, an independent review of what's going on in the party and uh, the forum as the means to discover what the members really think. Um, I think I more or less said what I wanted to about that. Uh, so that's the plan. I want to quickly mention that the canvassing software that uh, I have been working on is being used currently in Gravesend in a by-election, uh, and I'm pleased we've had a little bit of progress on that. It's actively being used even this evening, uh, and so I'm pleased that project's underway. And I had a software meeting on Sunday, uh, this last Sunday, uh, which went on for many hours, and we had a very useful and interesting conversation. And I expect the forum software to be uh, starting to emerge and hopefully be tested uh, soon, within the next month, I hope. Uh, so that's that, and that's addressed that issue. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, I've enjoyed your questions, uh, and I look forward to the next one, and I look forward to seeing you at branches uh, and at UKIP events. Uh, so uh, keep the faith. UKIP's a fantastic party. British independence is worth fighting for and campaigning for. We all believe in it. We all love our country. So keep the faith. Let's keep going. And hopefully one day we will get there. Thank you.